Okay, I'm just going to say very little on, on this section, even though I love music and I love art. <clears throat> I like to incorporate art and music history as much as I can. Um, but um, just to say that I think now we just take for granted that um, we've almost become beyond experimental now. And in the sense that because there's no real censorship, and I'm not even saying that there should be, but... Um, it's, it's hard to shock people now, let's be honest. I mean, I think Marilyn Manson, you know, he did some pretty shocking things um, for the religious community. Um, um, but it's always easy to be offensive to any religious community. You simply just, like, you know, destroy their holy book or you say something bad about it or whatever, and there you go. It's offensive, period, right? Um, but <clears throat> the idea of certain conventions that are expected out of artists and musicians and, and the idea of breaking from a, away from those conventions, we've just about, I feel like, could be wrong, that we've almost seen this thoroughly accomplished. And so now we, we take for granted the, the shock or the controversy or the awe of music forms and art forms that decided to totally go outside expectations. And, um, you know, you were reading in this textbook about some of the classical music composers that literally had riots um, people were making over such things. And I, I think maybe the other side of it is that when you don't have, like, necessarily the radio to play music all the time and, and iPods and um, computers, if you wanted to see music, a lot of times you had to go to see a musician. Right, so you had people on the streets, or you had someone at home with a piano or a guitar, and you could do it in that setting. Or to really go see music, you'd probably pay a lot of money, and uh, that's not something that everybody had access to, to go see music. And it's going to be a different effect, different type of situation, um, when you put it in that context, right? And so I think that we have a, a many uh, ac much of, we have so much access to art and music in a way now that we just I keep using the word take for granted, but we do. And um, I, I kind of feel like to, to try to visualize and conceptualize the ways in which some of the artists like Picasso, um, some of the artists like Stravinsky and Schoenberg in terms of like composers and music, or um, some of these other. Uh, uh, um, creators would have had at the time on the audience that they were reaching it's hard to conceptualize when we're under this arrangement but um i just kind of want to point that out and you know for jazz uh, um keep in mind now again that's something we also take for granted as some uh, but here it is you know coming into as a new music um but uh, I'm going to move on from there and not go into sp specific details. You should read about it in the text, and I just kind of wanted you to think about that aspect of it. Um, we, I, I hope you read The Trial of Oscar Wilde. Um, <clears throat> he's one of my favorite authors. He's a very interesting um, writer. There was a movie a few years ago, I think it was called Wilde, about him. And um, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it, but... Um, <sighs> For me, I personally am comfortable with. Um, I'm not. I wasn't uncomfortable with the fact that it was uh, overtly uh, homosexual, even though I'm not. But I'm totally fine with that. And I, my my ex-wife and I went with some friends of ours, a gay couple, and we watched it. And it it had a lot of sex scenes in it that were pretty graphic. That also, I I you know we, we talked about it afterwards with our our friends, and they were even. A little uncomfortable with it and I think that the reason I'm mentioning it is that um, I think the attempt was to kind of liberate that aspect of his life that he was oppressed for in the film and they kind of did that at the expense of also highlighting his literary uh, achievements and so you know this is what happens right when when you're an artist and uh, you are you're a thinker and you are also living a lifestyle that is against your own society society rather wants to suppress that or later like liber like like liberate that if you will and you know you're not even allowed to be both or just like it it, it muddles this whole question to in my opinion now this is not me this is me speaking uh, personally but as a person to look at a history of a character like him that 
he couldn't just have an affair with the, an affair with this guy. It it had to be something controversial, and um, so I think that you're always going to see that aspect there uh, until that's just normalized. Now, you read his writings, and he was always making a strong critique of his society. And one of the things he made a critique of was the hypocrisy of it. The Picture of Dorian Gray is one of the greatest novels um, that I would highly recommend that he wrote. If you want to talk about these contradictions within Western civilization, and in this chapter in particular, I think The Picture of Dorian Gray really, on so many levels, epitomizes the hypocrisy of this elegance of, of, of the beauty an elegance of Western civilization juxtaposed to this underlying classism and uh, all sorts of isms that 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 there's a dark side of results from that at times and um, yeah I you know he, he has a, a, a quote um, if a book wasn't worth reading once uh, um, twice if it wasn't worth reading twice it's not worth reading once and uh, I've read his book twice and I should read it again um, and he also has a poem called the ballad of writing jail and um, he talked about his prison time uh, and, and it killed him uh, and um, you know again now with the Supreme Court changing things and, and the way that uh, things have, have uh, gone in terms of legalizing gay marriage and I, I do recognize this is controversial for many people and I I, I do like to always try to like again be aware of that of my, with my students but I think I think what we're seeing now uh, I mean let's just remind ourselves that he went to prison and spent hard labor because he had this consensual thing with this other wealthy uh, guy and um, lived a lifestyle that um, society decided was not okay but you know sending a person to death was okay and um so that's what we want to, want to think about you know when we think about the situations that we're dealing with now and we're thinking about um you know here was someone who was 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 rich and influential and went down uh, uh facing some really harsh treatment so uh, in any case and, and by the way his kid stories are amazing uh, also and um i think that you should read them and, and um they're, they're, they're very profound. So um, I'm, that's all I'm going to say anymore about that. Okay. Um, when it comes to um, this artist, well, I'm just going to move on right now. Um, I think you get the point about what I was talking about with art. Um, <clears throat> and here, I think that we're seeing again a, tra a trend similar, right? I mean, I sympathize with this fact. Right now, as gay marriage is being legalized, Many people in the faith community who are not comfortable with that are really feeling under attack, even though it's not an attack on them. And, and, and I would argue that it's not in the sense that the law is not saying that religious people can't be religious or have their own beliefs about marriage. It's saying that the law allows other people to get married that the religious, some religious communities don't believe in. But, but that's never been done before. And there's no way for them not to feel it's no way for a person who has a, a traditional conservative view to see something that they assume to be the right way to then just completely be undermined by you know a uh, secular law is going to feel very weighty and you know i've lived in all sides of these things and i have family from all sides of them and i've been you know having these like, discussions over dinner and I get it I get it and I think you know when we're reading this chapter you see that the faith communities also were looking at all this with that same kind of weightiness you know and uh, uh, it, it makes sense that that you see this kind of tension boil and uh, uh, an attempt to kind of uh, regroup and assert um, you know uh, 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 one's position back in, in uh, that, that you feel that you had uh, uh, been demoted from, right? And the issue of the infallibility of the Pope uh, uh, was interesting, um, right? If you read that. Um, the, I, I think now, I, I mean, it's interesting because you even see that the current Pope 
basically said, okay, what scientists are saying about uh, globalizing about about global warming, yeah, they're right, and um, this is becoming uh, very complicated for uh, Republican Catholics who have been denying that there's global warming and at the same time loyalty to the Pope. And again, I think those kind of tensions and those kind of uh, issues have been around for a long time. Is all I'm trying to say. Um, uh, and so that's all I want to kind of say on that for now. Um, we'll move on here this this one painting and so here though right we have saw art uh, and looked at art that challenged um, kind of social norms like the one that I kind of brushed over that Egon Sheila the nude self-portrait he has some much more graphic ones trust me than the one you see in your textbook um, you have that then with this guy who's really asserting a type of Christianity I mean I think this is a great painting um, I like the colors and the mood um, but the, again, this was also an attempt to kind of almost reassert this this kind of Christian values, and it was very popular. Now, you probably this is the first time you've ever seen this painting, um, uh, and so you know that's the whole thing, though, right? With art, you never know what's gonna you know some things are popular in their day, then they fade out into obscurity, and other ones, you know, maybe this will get popular again like 20 years from now, you know, whatever. But okay, so. Um, Basically, uh, um, what I want to just return to is this idea of this new imperialism. Because uh, at this time, in the middle of all of, of what we were just talking about, where this kind of existential crisis that the, the West was having within itself, and, and doesn't seem to have stopped having within itself um, to this day, um, there's also the West relationship to the other world, which you cannot separate. And as we, I've been pointing out now, when it comes to the term the West, you can't say that term without its relationship to the East and to, other, to, to, to the rest of the world. I mean, you could probably say that about anywhere, but we are definitely talking about a global system, a global economy that is just that global. This is not isolationist. I mean, Japan once was isolationist, which we're going to talk about more, but the West now is officially, when you are eating and drinking, even to this day, everything that you're doing comes from somewhere else. And there's something happening somewhere else that we don't know about and we're not seeing before we get the items that we have. This technology, this computer, I don't know what conditions this was made in that I'm talking to you on right now, that, that I'm recording my voice into. I don't know. And I guarantee you that this was, uh, th there's a long history there's, the, there's a whole story about how this item that I'm talking into that gets me to, gets to you, the student, right now. Um, and uh, um, here we're seeing another story about this. Um, like, uh, so let me just stop here and I'm going to return to this a little bit more coherently.